well, it's a privilege to um, uh, speak to the computer forum about a topic that would be um, on the peripheral side of your world, because this is uh, uh, an area that would involve um, uh, both the physical and, and biosensing. And I have our EE125 logo. I'm gonna, I got that from our uh, department. Uh, and uh, we are uh, uh, going to celebrate our 125th uh, anniversary a little bit uh, uh, less than Stanford's 125th. Three years ago, we, we were launched from ME as a kind of eruption uh, in uh, uh, the late 19th century. So I um, uh, have been involved in resonant-based sensing since my uh, PhD decades ago, and it, for me it's extremely um, uh, attractive, and uh, I'd like to give you a little bit of a review in that, of that, uh, what it, what it uh, involves, and then dig into a particular um, application that I worked on uh, in the uh, 90s and more recently uh, have been uh, uh, helping with a spinoff of, a, of Cambridge University, a former student of mine. And I think that um, uh, would indicate the um, uh, potential breakthrough in, in applications and extremely precise uh, accelerometers. Uh, uh, shifting gears, um, uh, there's work at Stanford that started around 2010 and culminated with the launch of a startup a few years ago that would involve uh, uh, fingerprinting molecules based on uh, spectroscopy, but it's uh, tunneling electronic spectroscopy, which is normally not done at room temperature, but we figured out a way to do that. Uh, we meaning uh, colleagues uh, in uh, uh, my department and also uh, in the medical school, and uh, we'll give some examples of how that works. So with that, um, I borrowed a slide from um, um, a colleague Subhashri Sumitra in EENCS. Um, your problem um, uh, is actually um, uh, satisfying to me to be uh, uh, having you swim in our sensors, drowning in data, uh, is a very satisfying thing having come from the uh, um, um, well, I'm not going to do that. Uh, is there a laser pointer? I, I will not use one because I'd need to be doing it on both. So, so in any event, uh, where is this data coming from? Well, it's coming from this field of MEMS and sensors and wearables. And in fact, it creates some challenges. I was encouraged uh, uh, to see that there may be radical new ways to compute at, uh, right at the uh, uh, sensor as our bodies would do rather than uh, sending massive amounts of raw data um, uh, to the central processor. So um, a resonant mechanical system uh, is, is a, uh, a thing you may or may not have encountered. Uh, it's a very basic idea of a vibrating system. Think of a diving board. Uh, if you hit the resonance, you'll get, uh, I was able to do that at a very young age uh, off diving boards with a fairly low quality factor. Uh, but in fact, mechanical systems uh, can have extremely uh, high quality factors, they have resonant frequencies, and you can define the width of that uh, where it's down a square root of two, and you can uh, uh, define this Q. MEs and EEs use slightly different def uh, definitions. And so what's, um, um, uh, what's so important of that, uh, people try to avoid resonance in some mechanical systems. In fact, high, uh, resonators made in, on silicon chips uh, can be made uh, uh, to mimic a musical tuning fork. Uh, in fact, uh, you'd have this double musical tuning fork by a Stanford spinoff, Cytime, uh, that would be in your Apple Watch. Uh, it's this beautiful uh, 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 resonator at a specific frequency that you can divide down uh, to do uh, clocking. And so, uh, in any case, um, Here's some work that would have uh, led to a, uh, a higher frequency resonator that was from my uh, Berkeley days. Uh, this is a disc uh, resonator uh, in silicon germanium, and you can see cues that would be uh, over 50,000 at frequencies of tens of megahertz. Now, um, in fact, if you're building a clock, you want something that's completely independent of, of temperature, shock, or any other uh, environmental input. Uh, how do we make sensors out of these? Well, we um, uh, in fact have the benefit if the output is a shift in frequency or perturbation, we can measure time or frequency very, very well electronically. 
uh, and that uh, is in contrast to current or voltage. Um, uh, and so what we need to do is work on a resonator uh, so its frequency is perturbed. If it's temperature, that's going to be very easy. Uh, if it's something else, like acceleration, we're going to have to get a bit more creative. This is a violin, and it has resonant uh, 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 strings, and those can be tuned in several ways. Uh, I uh, don't play the violin. My wife plays the violin. Uh, if I had to do it, I'd just crank on those things, but I think that's fairly crude. Uh, there's other uh, ways in certain violins to tweak uh, the frequency. So could we make something like that in the micro scale? And that thought occurred many, many years ago. Um, in fact, having been born the same year Sputnik went up and living through the 1960s, as a few of you uh, may, may remember, um, uh, there was a lot of excitement about space exploration. And American Bosch, Arma, is a company on Long Island in the 1960s, uh, oddly enough connected to Bosch, a major pioneer in, uh, and the uh, uh, world's uh, leading MEM, MEM sensor manufacturer. And what this, they were trying to do is measure um, uh, gravity. And the way they did it is they had a macro structure with two vibrating strings. They were actually wires, two different masses. And in the vertical direction, you would have one uh, stretched and one uh, relatively compressed, and they could measure the differences in frequency. So they put this into an instrument, and um, uh, the funding, um, um, actually, there's a little bit of history. Those, uh, uh, those accelerometers were initially in ICBMs, and then they upgraded them. They became surplus. NASA got them, and uh, there was parallel efforts in the Soviet Union where the scientists got a hold of these uh, very precise uh, devices and used them for all kinds of different experiments. So um, the, um, uh, the, the instrument to the right has that embedded in it, and where did it go? Well, it went off uh, to the moon on Apollo 17 and mapped uh, the gravity of the, the moon. Uh, they, the, uh, Gene Cernan is uh, placing it on the surface of the moon, and they'd have, have a protocol to wait uh, and have things stabilized, and then they would get a reading of, of the moon's gravity. And, and uh, that um, uh, led to uh, some uh, insights. So that is not a consumer product. Uh, or even a, you know, this is uh, the 1960s with uh, the space race and infinite budgets, but um, it was interesting. It was a hack. They didn't develop the accelerometer. They got it from surplus and then built the instrument around it. But more recently, we can make things like that out of silicon, and this is a, a top view of a mass set of a uh, I'll give the credit to uh, Ashwin Seshi at Cambridge, um, and this derives from a, a history of work adapting this to silicon starting in the late 80s and through the 90s. But this one would be uh, a culmination of, of sensitivity where the um, uh, proof mass, of course, silicon is very light. There's actually uh, Archimedes uh, plays into this to stretch the resonators uh, and compress them with an amplification factor. And a lot of electronics, uh, and when you look at those resonators, of frequencies, when you have a strain induced by gravity, you perturb them. And so you work hard to eliminate any other effect. And, in, and recently, um, uh, about a year ago, uh, 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 the spinoff of Cambridge took one up to a British uh, geological survey up in Scotland and, um, and looked at measuring earth tides. Uh, this, um, uh, we're familiar with the ocean tides. Actually, uh, planet, the continents are also going up and down with uh, uh, the motion of the moon. Uh, we're not moving quite as much. In fact, uh, this is measured in um, uh, micro-gals. That's an interesting unit. Uh, gal for Galileo, uh, because Earth's G is not a constant. It depends on where you are. Uh, Galileo is not an SI unit. It's a centimeter per second squared. So a G is about 1,000 gal gals. And the gravimetry geophysics community uses gals. And, uh, and if you look at this, um, the gradient at the Earth's surface is around 3 microgals, and we're resolving um, uh, roughly 100 microgals on this uh, fit to the motion of the earth tide. So actually, uh, things are going up a significant fraction of uh, you know, tens of centimeters. So uh, what on earth would you use this for? I'll leave you to go to Silicon Microgravity's website, uh, because in fact, if you can image uh, into the ground, you can do a lot of interesting things. In, in the, uh, the west of North America, one thing I would say would be interesting is to look at um, this map uh, from a paper in geophysics. And you can see. Um, 
uh, areas that are highlighted as uh, potential substantial conflicts or likely conflicts. Okay, what, are they, what is the fight over? Well, it's over water. And in fact, uh, we would be in the center of one of those uh, 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 conflict zones. Uh, currently, these are legal battles between states and between water districts uh, uh, over who gets the groundwater. And, and so in fact, gravimetry can be very useful in this paper at great cost. They were mapping groundwater in uh, Colorado as a function of <clears throat> how the, the, the cities are pumping and things. And I think the, if you can drop the cost of that in order of magnitude or two, you can get very high resolution maps and find out what's going on in California's Central Valley or the uh, aquifer under Nebraska and manage that much better. So I think that, that this uh, will bring a, um, a level of precision. And, and by the way, the uh, silicon microgravity uh, the sensor is about 100 times uh, more sensitive than the Apollo 17 mission. And, uh, probably <clears throat> much more than 100 times less expensive. So, so you would have this breakthrough, and I think instrumenting the Earth is, is, a, uh, uh, is something we will need to do in order to manage our scarce uh, resources, head these conflicts off. So I'm going to shift gears in the second half of the talk and talk about a, <clears throat> something that there is a connection uh, to the first half, but this is going to the um, nanoscale and below. Uh, we're... Uh, familiar at some level, uh, chemistry was in the past for most of us, um, quite a ways back. Uh, but um, uh, remember the ball and stick models and vibrational modes of, of, of something like ammonia. Um, actually, this is a molecule that will surface later in the talk um, uh, and uh, uh, would be something that is very useful in the uh, 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 MEMS community. It's a self-assembled monolayer precursor. You can make carpets of these on, on uh, surfaces. And um, <clears throat> this is a much more complex model I'm not showing in animation. And over to the right is a neuro Toxin. You may be familiar in my neighborhood, there's a sign, uh, you know, stop, Botox. Okay, you can, I guess, get Botox injections on the way home. I obviously haven't stopped in, um, but, uh, but that's uh, this uh, uh, botulin, botulinum uh, bacteria is, uh, excretes this uh, neurotoxin that can be quite lethal. And in fact, uh, uh, some of the research we were doing was targeting, uh, detecting that. So that's a very complicated molecule that, uh, <clears throat> in fact, uh, 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 electrical engineers and all, we, we didn't work on the actual toxin. There's a surrogate that's very similar that's uh, safe for electrical engineers and computer scientists. So uh, in any case, uh, <clears throat> what um, was discovered 50 years ago, uh, and this is in the days of, uh, of research labs uh, in corporations, this is Ford Research, uh, a couple of uh, researchers uh, accidentally discovered something where they measured uh, tunneling currents between two electrodes uh, and uh, had a contaminant molecule in between and were picking up the signatures in the current versus voltage uh, that uh, indicated vibrational states in the molecules. And being physicists, they dove in. There's a whole world of inelastic electronic uh, tunneling spectroscopy that was developed. Uh, you don't need a mass spec. You can do this electronically. Uh, in fact, uh, recent work at IBM Zurich uh, would have looked at a, um, a self-assembled monolayer and looked at various uh, stretching and, and bending and rocking modes from, uh, this is the uh, uh, conductance spectrum. It's the second derivative of current with respect to voltage. And so this looks like a useful technique that you would use perhaps in a, a molecular sensor. Um, and in fact, it's not used very widely. The problem is that these very sharp resonances are there at four Kelvin. Uh, so the measurements on the, on the uh, uh, IBM work is done at very, very low temperature. Um, colleagues in physics, uh, liquid helium is a commodity, uh, and uh, that's not a problem. Uh, I, I'm interested in a sensor that would be um, uh, much more um, uh, leveraging the benefits of uh, electronics and, and, uh, and be a room temperature device. So um, I had a postdoc coming from Urbana who'd seen some unusual signatures in his PhD, and I knew his advisor, and, and that uh, handoff of uh, uh, Chaitanya Gupta was the uh, individual, was a uh, huge shot in the arm, because at Stanford he unraveled this, 
that um, uh, rather than a metal-metal junction, there are advantages in an electrochemical interface. And uh, in fact, we can sweep this as if we had a, a junction uh, carefully. And, um, and we would get those tunneling currents. At room temperature, uh, we're probably not going to see anything because everything is too hot and everything is washed out. Just too many coupling to vibrational baths. But in fact, uh, if we're very careful in designing the interface, and, and um, um, as a, uh, someone who minored in chemical engineering uh, uh, to um, uh, contribute back to that literature, the Journal of Physical Chemistry, uh, we um, and my uh, colleague Boris Merman uh, had a paper that um, uh, engineered a, an electrode that was at the nanoscale. Actually, it was at the nanoscale to begin with. It's 50 nanometer diameter. That's our macro lead. We have uh, self-assembled monolayers linked to a nanoparticle. That engineers the surface to allow a, um, uh, these tunneling currents to be very uh, 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 carefully, uh, uh, they, they, they are uh, not a, a wash in parasitics, it's still at room temperature. So uh, I'm not going into the details. For those that are, uh, have uh, ever tried to make something, uh, this was a, um, uh, one of the strangest things that I think uh, uh, Stanford uh, Nanofab has ever made. Uh, we were actually doing fabrication on a tunneling tip, uh, which is this incredibly sharp thing. And the reason for doing that was we could actually do it faster. Um, I um, have spent my career in lithography and, and uh, etching and that sort of thing, but this uh, was actually built with a focused ion beam and then assembled in by hand uh, and do, done very carefully to withdraw this STM tip, actually a little pre-drilled hole in the PDMS, carefully back. Uh, it's a polymer film and we were able to pull it till it was right there and get, get a signature, a signal uh, that we were um, uh, able to do this quickly. And the secret was uh, high school students. Uh, many of us have high school interns, and these are very bright people from the area. And um, um, they don't drink coffee yet. And uh, they uh, actually have really good hands. And that was uh, important. These uh, graduate students are hopeless, even the undergrads at Stanford, uh, uh, that uh, caffeine uh, oscillation. So in any case, we put this in an electrochemical cell and did our measurements uh, using uh, uh, appropriate shielding. But in fact, um, uh, we, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, grant, bought some uh, of the world's best uh, potentiostats to have the lowest noise measurement of current. You need three electrodes, as you may uh, remember. Uh, I won't go into the details. But in fact, we didn't see any signatures uh, using the classical potentiostats. So we decided to do something uh, to actually work on an, an ultra-low noise uh, potentiostat. And there was some connection to this earlier MEMS work. I, had a, a very strong student who um, uh, is now in the faculty, Clark Nguyen at Berkeley, and uh, uh, we, we decided to play with this Q factor that, that was related to the dissipation in the structure electronically, and we actually found a way to, our goal was to decrease the Q, changing the sign of the feedback, we could increase the Q, which is effectively cooling the device. Uh, with a very high Q device, that would mean very precise uh, in order to drop the temperature even further. So in, in any case, uh, uh, there are classical techniques that would uh, have inspired this where we work on a, a potentiostat that's got a different architecture and an effort to drop the, uh, the noise as close to zero as we could. Now, that's classical. Aren't we doing tunneling? Uh, and in fact, there is a simple quantum mechanical model that indicates that the tunneling electrons with this feedback loop can be decoupled from this thermal, thermal bath at room temperature. And that is a, a paper in the Journal of Applied Physics that, again, is not an easy read. So um, uh, there is a, an analogy to laser cooling, uh, but it's a quite different thing. We're linking it to a cool electronic system in order to get a lower temperature. So what happens when we... Um, build this potentiostat. It is 
a board at this level. There's a PhD defense on Friday where it becomes a CMOS chip. And uh, Boris Merman and his uh, team of postdocs and students, some are now faculty members, one's up at Slack, and uh, the junior student is now the, uh, defending on, on Friday. So the Gamry was a $10,000 instrument, uh, and we uh, paid that uh, in order to get the best low noise uh, instrument. But in fact, Stanford EE uh, people, and I'm crediting Boris Merman for this, uh, can drop things orders of magnitude below. So what is the temperature of these tunneling electrons? Uh, we would love if it was four Kelvin. Currently, we're only getting to 30, okay? There's no ice forming. <laughs> Everything is liquid in room temperature, but the critical um, uh, tunneling electrons are locked into something much colder. Now, we're not violating the second law. That board is getting warm. The chip is getting warm. We're, we're moving energy around, and we're, of course, losing. But for our measurement, this is incredibly important. So the IVs are radically different depending on which uh, uh, potentiostat you use. And I'm not going to go through the, the details of this, but this hysteretic uh, current voltage curve, and we're getting nanoamps out of this uh, and sweeping um, uh, voltages. What we're looking for are peaks. And so uh, what if we added an analyte and we have sweeps where we're doing um, an amino acid? D indicates deuterium. It's heavy hydrogen, and we put one heavy hydrogen on this uh, amino acid. And in fact, those uh, conductances, uh, those conductance peaks are shifting. The fingerprint is different. And if you're familiar, uh, you have a heavier resonance and you just shift, shift the peak. So this was extraordinarily encouraging um, and is in this uh, uh, paper. What happens with Bont A? This was our, our target. Well, I've overlapped a whole bunch of these just to show you how complex it is because we're looking in human serum. There's a lot of proteins, 50,000 of them. Uh, it turns out none of them look like uh, this neurotoxin, <laughs> okay? So, so what we did is we um, did these scans at different concentrations. We have references. We do cross-correlation, uh, no machine learning at this, at this stage. But we were able to do a, a, a set of, uh, of uh, uh, um, data processing, signal analysis, uh, that would have a correlation when we're getting uh, down to picomolar of, of Bont A. And in fact, that is um, at the limit of, of an ELISA assay, which is the gold standard. So that was very encouraging. This is a, a simple plot of correlation versus concentration. Uh, more data would be needed. And in fact, we are uh, doing quite well in a label-free assay. And in fact, if we had more references, we could go look for some more things out of the same data set we could remine. So with that, um, we uh, were happy to have engineered the interface, cooled, found a way with uh, Professor Merman to cool things down, some, do some initial data analytics, and we have a broad spectrum sensor. So what that did in the conclusion is a typical Stanford experience. Uh, it led to a company. Uh, we're in Sunnyvale at the Fault Line Brewing Company. Uh, this is more the hardware side of things. So uh, we're in a, uh, uh, the MMRI uh, incubator, and we have uh, Chaitanya is now CTO, um, and uh, we are committed to our values that would include not uh, destroying ourselves in the process of getting this company launched, but it's a, it's a biomedical startup, so it's a long haul uh, with a lot of validation of, of data and a lot of Stanford IP and a lot of people helping. Um, and um, um, uh, DARPA would be interested in sepsis, a blood infection syndrome. But in fact, many people are interested in food safety. There's been a lot of problems with food safety. People like fresh food. That's straining the supply chain. Think Chipotle. Think of the, um, what is it? The um, uh, McDonald's is going to have one burger that's fresh, competing with In-N-Out and other places. But uh, um, it, it is nice. Uh, the current uh, uh, food safety protocols uh, uh, don't lead to uh, a lot of uh, continuous outbreaks of uh, food uh, uh, poisoning. But uh, uh, in fact, uh, I think new technology is needed. We were up in Canada and won a uh, Best New Technology Award from uh, a food 
safety conference. So we're looking for things that are relevant, like salmonella assay, uh, through its effect on the soup of what we are looking at. In this case, it's cereal and bran from the European Food Safety Authority, a very different direction. Uh, but <clears throat> people are interested in peanut allergen. And uh, so we're looking at those things and uh, doing trials with some partners. So in any event, I um, would like to acknowledge a lot of colleagues. One former colleague, Lester Mackey, you may remember, was in statistics. He's now at Microsoft Research, helped with uh, some of the analytics. A bunch of students, including high school interns, who are now elsewhere. Uh, and uh, 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 the uh, credit uh, to this is a seed grant. Uh, as usual, the Stanford BioX came through. That led to DARPA funding in an uh, interesting quantum program, and then with the uh, dialysis-like therapeutics. And I'd like to credit my former student because I worked in some of this precision mechanical sensing, because I think that's a direction that would be of use to uh, you know, this audience that would have very broad interests. So I'm a little bit late. Thank you very much for your attention. So, any okay? Well, can I ask you a question? Uh, sure. <laughs> the last slide I saw that it said um, time to assay rapidly, you know, and and so on. Yeah, rapid. Okay. Rapid. Okay, so. Let me go back. What's rapid? I mean, can we, if there's food on my table, do you think it's consumer enough to like just wave a wand and figure out? Well, it depends on how hungry you are. <laughs> because often getting home and looking at uh, something good, it's, oh, it's got to be good. And uh, I've been around enough that I've, you know, I, I guess uh, it's t 10 minutes is the goal okay. for some, you know, for some of these. So to be doing more spot testing as you deliver uh, these, uh, the lettuce, we've been down in Salinas Valley, where a lot of the lettuce in the US comes from. It's a very different world. Uh, so uh, nanotechnology interfacing with this, maybe making uh, the food less wasteful. Currently, there's a lot of waste. And uh, maybe we can deal with, help with that. Great. So, Any other questions from the audience? And I apologize for the data problem, but uh, we can't help ourselves. We're so thrilled to be uh, just spewing this uh, out everywhere <laughs> after all these years of working so hard um, to get anything uh, that would get uh, uh, yeah. things uh, going that, uh, and, and hope that it will stimulate uh, uh, creative work to get the computing as close to the center. So thank you. <laughs>